All right, good evening, everyone. We are meeting with Sharon Loudon this evening, and I don't know Sharon very well. At least I haven't known her very long. I feel like we've known each other since her book came out, and you guys um, started telling me how great it is. Um, let me see if I can pull up an image huh. of the book. And um, I think mine's in the house. Can you see this? Can you see the book here on Amazon? Um, Sharon, so this book has been out like, what, six months now, right? Five months. And what printing is it in? Fourth. That's amazing. All right. Thank Sharon, you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Nice to see all of you. It's a pleasure. I feel very grateful. So how did you get it? You're an artist first and foremost. Isn't that the number one thing in your art, et cetera, career is art? Uh, yes, but I think that my life has changed a lot because I, I think I'm more of a culture producer and, uh, I'm, uh, I, my work is the core and then things, things, uh, branch off from that. All right, let's get to that in a moment. I'm just, um, where were you born? Where were you raised? I was born in South Philadelphia and I was raised outside of Washington, D.C. And, uh, did you, as a kid, did you think of yourself as an artist as a child? Were you, were you, was there a sense that you were going to grow up to be an artist? Yeah, since I was five, I never thought about it. I mean, I never even thought that I, I had a title. It was just what it was. I was just an artist. You know, I find that to be the case frequently. All right, so then when you went to high school. You went to college. You went to college to pursue an art degree. I went to public high school. I had a fantastic art teacher. I was being an artist. So then I did. Uh, I went to school at uh, for for art at SIT and Yale. In that order. I went to yeah school of the art in Chicago for my bachelor's and got my master's degree at Yale and I paid for my education myself. What was your thinking about getting a master's degree? What motivated you and was it justified? No, I really wasn't thinking about career at all, at all. I was just thinking about the language that I had to develop, but I knew I needed more and I needed more, uh, I wouldn't say training, but I needed more direction to figure out how I can go on my own. So are you pleased with that decision, the, the graduate school part of the art school equation? Well, what? Did you hear me or we broke up? No, it's okay. The, the breaking up is like one every two seconds, one, one or two seconds. So I worry that I'm missing you, but just as long as you're okay with it. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, uh, it was the best thing I've ever done. The, I always say that the best things in my life are that I got married, first first thing, and the second thing, going to Yale for my graduate work. Best thing. The third thing was another thing that has to do with my career, but that those are the three things. Yeah, you just broke up again. Sharon, let's, why don't you call in and see if we can make, do it that way, okay? Okay, let me do that now. Bye. All right, bye. Um, yeah, and you may have to get off the audio portion of this to do that. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to uh, call in. Okay. Go ahead. I'll pause this for a second while you do that. We'll see. All right. Is that good? Um, yeah, I think that's okay. Thank you. Let's see if this works better than the uh, the other audio. Um, how? All right. So you talked about the the three things, but and then let's let's segue. Up. I mean, how long? How long have you been surviving on your art and your teaching? How long have you been an adult? Since I graduated from Yale. Which is what, 10 years? 1991, 23 years. Wow. I'm old. People are, get, people are catching up to me. Um, how, all right, and then you wrote this wonderful book. How did you come Thank to you. write a book? Uh, well, first of all, I edited the book. So the book is edited, meaning that um, I have 40 artists come and say, uh, for the book, they wrote essays about how to make a living or how they yeah, make a living. That's not how it began. Forty artists didn't come to you and say, Sharon, I've written this essay. Can you find 
39 others and they were all there, etc. Somebody came, I'm assuming somebody came to you or you went to somebody with an idea. I did a, well, thank you for asking. I did a, uh, uh, a College Art Association panel discussion and then uh, somebody saw me, a publisher saw me in the audience in select books and they came to me and they said, we really want you to write a book. And I said, I'm not comfortable with writing a book. I want to then I, I, I thought about all different ideas that I could do uh, as far as putting forward an idea for a book. And I just remember being out of college and being frustrated because artists weren't helping other artists, and it was driving me crazy. And if they, I, wasn't, I wasn't being helped, nor did I have anything to give, or how, I didn't know how to give. And so um, that coupled with the idea that I think artists are wildly dependent on a gallery system really frustrated me. So I thought, why don't I just ask 40 people I really uh, respect, ages, nine, uh, ages uh, 30 to 66, 19 people from New York, 19 people from the rest of the country, and two people from Europe to talk about how they make a living. And no advice is in the book. It's just straightforward and, and talks really about how they make a living. You there? Yeah, I'm just thinking. Sorry. Um... Okay, and then you ran this by an editor. I mean, how, did you have to run the concept and the, and the 40 participants were those approved, or did you have part blanche? No, I got the I got the manuscript together, and I was able to give that to a uh, to my publisher, and they approved it, and then we went from there. And now it's gone wildly uh, on fire. I mean, I, I clearly I think there's a need for this conversation, and like the webinars that you do, and I think it's really smart for the people who are um, here with us today, everybody, hi, everybody, uh, to be together to listen, because I, I think uh, to all of the things that you're, everybody is absorbing, because that kind of stuff didn't occur 23 years ago, nor does it occur in many other universities across the country. That kind of outreach isn't there, and I just know because we're on a 45-stop book tour, and we've been to 25 stops of the 45 stop book tour, and I've just seen that it's, there's a really great need. Are you hearing any? Did you notice people in the in the book saying common things, or, or, or better yet, what are the common things that you heard repeated in the book? And, and then, and then I want to ask about what kind of common things come up in the book tour. Um, but let's uh, focus on the book itself for a moment. What are the kinds of things that people echo to, through each other? I'll tell you one thing that is the number one thing is that keeping your expenses low is the number one thing to sustaining a creative life. Um, the rest of the things are all varied and personal to the artists that are there and, and then personal to the people who are reading it. Um, that can, they can attach to. As far as on the book tour, wow, that has been eye-opening. Excuse me, the public thinks that the artists look a certain way, then they should only make a certain amount of money, and they should only, uh, and also that we don't work hard enough. And that's really been very disappointing to me, so I've been being very vocal in making that correction. I think the wild the reason why this book is doing so well is because the uh, the public is buying it. It's, they're interested in what artists do. But I think, like my mother-in-law said, she felt like it was very boring and that artists are just like everybody else, which is very true. Yeah, even like um, musicians. Um, yeah, okay. So how did how did the, you get in touch with the public? I mean, so I guess what you're saying is, is the public is showing up at your tour stops at bookstores, and they are listening to the dialogue. Yeah, it's not really in bookstores though. They've been in museums mostly, museum, uh, non for profits, uh, alternative spaces. I've been on Bloomberg Radio, on NPR. So there's been a terrific outreach that is uh, beyond the art world, which I think is very important to stress. So let's talk. I, I hadn't anticipated going in this direction. Let's talk about the the public, the art world. What are their conceptions, or I, I don't know. I want to call them misconceptions, but I'm not so sure. Right. What does the public <laughs> think? 
you know, I just don't think that they, I think there's a real disconnect between uh, what the public thinks an artist is in society and what an artist is and what they can offer. And I think there's a terrific disconnect between uh, what the role of artists are today. And I think that's partially because uh, artists, uh, don't make themselves, I think, available to the public in a way that the public understands, and the public doesn't make themselves available to artists and how they can understand. So there's a big disconnect, and uh, I like that through this book, those conversations are are uh, being had. So we, I'm going to be at LACMA on uh, Monday, a week from today, and that's what I'm going to be bringing up at LACMA. Every book event is very different than one another because um, it depends on the audience and the venue. But you seem to be getting this not art response at art venues. I mean, it seems to me like most of them are at museums, or most of your discussions are at art venues, but you're getting a non-art response at these places? Is that, or are you getting, or are there, I'm assuming that the people at the museums are not as, ignorant or as benign as you're saying, but maybe I'm wrong. No, it's a combination. I think that also uh, it's very interesting how artists perceive themselves. Um, I think that um, artists, uh, what I've noticed on the book tour, uh, seem to be isolating themselves. Um, that fundamentally there seems to be only a few ways that artists believe that they can make a living or sustain a creative life. Which, which, uh, which, after doing this book, but also after my own experience and what I've known for many years, that is disheartening. That artists have that, um, you know, that distance or that uh, idea. So it's it's been really rewarding. The essays in the in this book, some of them are opaque because they were more opaque than the ones that are transparent because it depends on the personality of the artist. Sure. So it's it's just uh, it, either they start a conversation or they end the conversation. So there's a terrific range of, uh, of, of wonderful um, conversations that happen uh, based on this book tour. And, there, and my husband just walked in. My husband I, of many years. Really? Neither of you look old enough, um, <laughs> especially you. Um, so are, are you saying that from reading your book, you didn't learn all that much, but from going on the road, you learned a lot? Is that what, I, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I, I, I knew the artist stories because I, I picked the artist, so I didn't, I didn't really learn so much out of the book because I knew the stories already. Um, uh, I, I think that there were some surprises in the book for me that some of the artists were revealing uh, more so than I thought. Um, and then, uh, but more, way more so on the book tour, because I don't know a lot of the people I meet on the book tour. And that has been really compelling and interesting and, uh, and definitely entertaining and enlightening and informative. Um, and I, 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 the, the, the book events are like town hall meetings that artists just want to talk and have exchange. And some, and there's always an oddball in the audience. I think that's like that everywhere whenever you do a discussion. But it's been, it's been extraordinary. It's been great. So, my sense from looking at your images of most of the book tour stops is that you're doing, leading a panel discussion. But what format does the book, what, what format does it usually take? Is that right? Yeah, because that, the, it's been working that way the best, where we have a panel discussion for like 30 minutes, and then for 45 minutes or so there's the, is the audience participation. And that has been very enriching and interesting and enlightening and wonderful. But the, the moderated section is only to warm people up, and then it gets people going and makes them present and forward. And then from that, we, we also live tweet during the events, and so there's social media conversation, and then there's blog out into the blog sphere. People talk about it. So it's just a constant conversation 
which I think is very interesting and compelling. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens when I stop doing the book tour and that uh, I'm going to be doing another book, but that won't come out for a couple of years. I need a little break. But I think that um, after the book tour is done at the end of this year, it will be interesting to see if artists start to change or or um, open up and see all the positive aspects of doing other things in addition to what they thought that they should be doing. Okay. One of the, you know, I mean, I've been doing this course now for about four years, and one of the things that surprised me is how many artists are doing more than two things, more than three things to earn a living. And that, you know, three is, is sometimes a minimum, that there are many artists who are doing one thing, making their art, and, you know, working on their art career. But there's many who have multiple careers going on simultaneously. What kinds of things have surprised you? Is that one? Are there what others? That doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. I think um, I, I think the choices in which artists are they, they make. I think the. Uh, I mean, I don't really have many surprises from the artists in the book, like I said. But I I do think that the artists on the tour that I meet, I I am very surprised by the limitations that they set themselves up with. So, for example. If they are making a living by, let's say you're saying two or three other things, they're selecting jobs that are not necessarily fulfilling to them and not thinking how they can create opportunities for themselves to make uh, maybe the, the choices in having certain jobs or uh, how they position their time and their life beneficial to their work. So it, that's very interesting to me. Um, I also think that people have this idea that the fact that artists don't research enough or don't do things on their own enough, and that classic dependency with the gallery system is still the chronic problem. So I think that that is the singular problem that I see the most. That I mean, I have four galleries, and I love working with them, but they uh, are all my partners. They're not the exclusive means in no way that for me to to uh, uh, make a living. So, I mean, I do many, many, many things to make a living. It's crazy. It's like piecemeal, but it's all wrapped up in one, and it, it has all extension of my practice. Have you been away from your art making for a while? Well, on purpose for a couple reasons. One, uh, I had a ton of shows last year, and I did a lot of hard work in my studio, but then I had a fire in my house, and uh, and that sort of, that life change really set us back, and I haven't wanted to make work, to be honest, but now I'm gearing up to make work, and I have to be settled in an environment to make work, so this is the first time this has ever happened to me before, and, uh, but when I'm settled, and I'll be, I'll be forced to this, because I have a deadline coming up, I'll be... I'll be making work again. But uh, I've been purposely put this book tour as this time now to stack it up while I can, too. And I like the energy and the momentum behind it, but I am getting burnt out, and I'm ready to go back to my studio. How much more do you have to go? You said you suggested you're barely halfway. Yeah, I'm a, a little over halfway. <laughs> and when, does it, when are you done? <clears throat> I've got 19 more to go, so the majority of them will be done by July 5th, and okay. then I have four or five more in the fall, and then that's a piece of cake. No big deal. I think, I think when we began, you said you see yourself as a cultural producer. Is that the term you used? Yeah. All right. So that yields more questions. When did you decide you were a cultural producer instead of an artist, and what's the difference? I think that I'm an artist who is a cultural producer. Okay. Uh, I think I think that they are connected. The, I think the difference is an artist is someone who just does maybe in my mind. Well, I mean, I think they're both the same in a lot of ways, but I think that I'm doing things that are beyond uh, reach of my artistic practice, although I see it connected like this book, for example, um, and then like uh, many other things I'm doing in my life. So I think that cultural producing is more about the public realm in a lot of ways. 
Uh, but it's all wrapped up in who I am as an artist. And there are many other people who do the, take this form, like Adrian Outlaw, who's in the book, and who I know has spoken to you guys, and Michelle Gravner, and many other artists, Austin Thomas, many other artists do this same thing, that they do many other things that uh, create a, a whole world for them. Yeah. Um, do you feel like... I don't know. I'm I, I'm assuming that the last six months will change what your art looks like. No. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, no I, way. I would I would I would make I would make a wager. Um, <laughs> so we will, we will have to discuss this. I will have to point out the differences to you. Okay. Um, why do you think it's not going to change your art? Why do you think your aesthetic will not be changed because of this wealth of personal experiences? Well, I think my vision is so private in a lot of ways, and it's of me, and it's that it's like waiting for me right now. It's I, I see it right in front of me. I, I think of it as this, as my truth. It's my only truth. And not that I'm not telling the truth to everybody on this tour, but certainly if I'm not exactly... Uh, the same person I am in front of my husband or in my studio, for that matter. So I think that that truth comes out. I think that, um, uh, I mean, if you were to ask me if it would change, uh, I, I, mean, I suppose it could change just by me living, but not necessarily by the effects of the people I've been speaking with, because I'm talking about other things that are not, have anything to do with my vision, which is sort of, the poetry of how I live or, or my life in a way. It's my vocabulary that is of my truth, and that's the most important thing to me in my living and breathing. But I do love to give, and I love to be uh, somebody who can be a catalyst for change in the way that artists think and do in their life. Do you do that by being a visual artist, or do you do that by having book discussions? I do both. I mean, I think that uh, just by being a visual artist, by making my work, but, you know, the work, my work is not, it doesn't yield to that, these conversations. My work is about contributing something of beauty and, and the different windows of, of, uh, of color and architecture and whimsy and life. So it's not really about, oh, there's my work, yay, I miss my work. It's not really about that. That's a nice of you, Paul, thanks. Um, that makes me blush. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I just think that these, I'm a formalist in my life, in my work, and, and then I feel like I'm a mini activist in a lot of ways with these town forums that I'm much more of a, uh, as I'm a vehicle for my work, I feel like I'm a vehicle for myself as an artist in the community. That's so nice of you to do that. That was very sweet. Okay, you can take it off now. <laughs> Valerie wanted to know. Um, <clears throat> I'm hearing you say that you're dealing with comparable issues in these talks, the book, and your visual art. Is that so? Comparable issues in my work? Uh, in that connection? What's the connection? That's what I'm asking. The connection to your audience and trying to enlighten artists and um, show them a better path or show them a richer path. I'm wondering if your art is doing that. I'm wondering if I heard you correctly. What I heard was is that both your art and your speaking tour are addressing comparable issues. They're addressing different issues. I think that they're addressing different issues, but I'm the same person. I feel like as an artist who has a vocabulary that is of a truth that I've been nurturing and developing for many years, that I have something to offer, and because of that, I feel like I have a membership card to the artist community and that within that membership card we can all uh we can we can be connected under that umbrella. And so maybe I use that membership card uh just just to maybe go to town hall forums and speak and then maybe I'll go back to my church and that's my pr praying is with my work. So I, I don't know. I see it as a connection but it's certainly not a literal connection. My work is who I am, for sure, but it's also the most private place for me that 
hopefully evolves from me into the world in in the way in which that can uh, bring some happiness and beauty into the world, as cliche as that is, but I, I totally embrace that. Let's talk about being married. Um, ah, I love it. How long have you been married? I have been married, well, I have to say, how do I say this? I, I, I'll answer that question a little differently than just that answer, if you don't mind. I've known my husband 35 years. I've been sleeping with him for 20 and married for 16. If I offended anybody, I'm so sorry. So that makes you, what, 78 if I put them all, add them all together? <laughs> no. Um, no. So um, I'm going to be 50 in a month. Yay. Um, all right, so now, how, how long have you been married? Would you say 20 years? 15. Uh, six, 16 years. How has being married affected your art career? Oh, that's a great question. I think it takes a village, just like the essays in the book says. It, it, and nobody says that exactly, but you can tell by all the essays in the book that it takes a village to make a creative life. And whether that's you've got friends who are supportive or you've got parents or you've got husbands, you've got wives, you've got children, you've got a framer, you've got a photographer, you've got a gallerist, you've got curators, you've got people who believe in you. My husband is a jazz musician, but he's also a producer. He loves to produce things. He's brilliant at it. And so uh, it took me a long time to let go of my being such a control freak. And uh, we work together. He is now my project manager. He's been doing that now for a few years, and it's the best thing I have ever done. And so I should have done it a long time ago, but I couldn't get over myself or my insecurities enough to allow for that. Um, but it's been really good. It is, how has it changed me? It has made things much easier in my life. I don't really, I'll give you an example, if you don't mind. I'm taking up everybody's time, but I'll give you a short example. My husband was project managing, um, his name is Vince. He was project managing this public art piece. And there was this guy at the head of facilities who was just, we called him Darth Vader. I couldn't even deal with him. He made me so depressed and I don't cry very easily, only in movies. So I, cry, I was crying. I was so upset with him. And so it was very funny. Vince became, he's usually like a liaison for me with all my galleries, with everybody. He is the one who takes all my venting and then becomes this wonderful neutralizer so I don't lose relationships because I'm such a crazy, hothead Sicilian. So I, I would, te I said, I text Vince whenever Darth Vader would come in the room. We had all these students, artists, not students, artists working for us at a, at a very good way, as I might say, w with this public art piece. And so they would scatter because they were so affected by this guy too. And I would text Vince, Darth Vader is here, and he would come and save me. So that's how he worked for me. It's perfect, so I can just do my work. But it took me a long time and us a long time to figure that out. And Peter Drake in the book has the same. His wife is like his project manager. There are many people in different roles that help artists uh, make a living. And, the, and I was asked on the book tour on a uh, web, on a uh, podcast uh, radio interview in, in Atlanta. Somebody asked, do you think that artists have problems asking for help? I would say absolutely. So I should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. I don't know if it's artists or it's just people. I think most people have difficulty asking for help. I'm always curious about whether the things we attribute to people are, you know, artists are the same, you know, have the same, you know. I agree. I, I agree fully. I mean, I, I can never ask anybody for money, but my husband can ask any single person that walks in the door. And so – I think you, you find people who do things better than you and then help them, ask them to help you do things that can maximize your creativity. But I don't assume that most people have supporting spouses for their art career. I mean, I think, you know, the, the best case scenario for many artists is to have a, a spouse who's benign, who supports their art making and or, and or accepts it but doesn't get, you know, personally and physically involved probably except to go to an occasional opening. Um, you know, there are certain artists, there are certain curators that I know are married and I've never met their spouse. You know, and I've seen them a hundred times. 
Um, I wonder. Um, well, can I say something to that? I, sure. As I said, it's not, I mean, for me, the spouse, you just asked about me as far as me being married, but that's the answer for me. But I think that, um, and that has to do with a lot of other things, too, because I enjoy my husband, so we just ended up working together. But I do think that uh, there are many situations you can have, like Adrian Alwa started her own nonprofit organization. So there, there, are, there are many, it's for her support, her husband has nothing to do with the art world, nor understands a lot of it either. So there, there are just many scenarios that one can find for themselves as far as how they can help them uh, succeed. And other artists, my God, that's the key. Do you feel that the act of being a woman makes being an artist more challenging? Yes. Let's talk about that for a moment. Tell me why. Oh, because I'm a bitch and you would never call a man a bitch. So if I'm acting out in a way that a man would, I'd be the bitch. So who's going to be more difficult? Is an art a woman artist who's aggressive and has a lot of balls or a man who's aggressive and has a lot of balls? So I think it's still where we've gotten better, but it's still bad. And I think that that's, I mean, you know, probably one of the reasons why I feel better, too, is that, and it's such a cliche, but, like, when I'm venting and going nuts and I have to get myself to be very, very, I have to calm down and I have to be professional, but even at that, it sounds as though if I'm, if I'm asking for too much or if I'm direct in what I ask for, heaven forbid, for me, if as an artist, as a woman, it's not nearly as received as a man who does the same. And I've seen this over and over again. And from my experiences, that has been the case. We are getting better. I really do believe that's getting better. But I think that, uh, you know, I, I just basically don't work with people who can't put up with me or can't see that I have a lot to give and I, I have a lot to, uh, a lot, I believe, in exchange and, and love. And um, that sounds corny, but it's true. And the bigger picture. And they have to be able to understand me enough to, to see that that's a value no matter how it's delivered. And also the other person can't be so insecure about that either. Do you think there's anything stereotypical all the men artists were prone to saying in the book and all the female artists were prone to saying in the book? I mean, you talked about it takes a village. Would the men say that? Oh, I think they would. I, the people in this book, you bet. I know Peter Drake would in a heartbeat. Uh, I think David Humphrey would, no question about it, because he has all this help with galleries, and then he – he, he works with galleries, but then he also does all these other projects. He's doing opera with a whole group at Maryland Institute College of Art. I mean, there he, he does writing. He he does all these different things. I mean, I think definitely um, people would. I, I don't think that that taking a village has. I think that's for artists, no matter the gender. Okay, what about having children? Um, it seems to me that having children usually besets. <laughs> I'm looking for an, you know, an obtuse and neutral word, but a, a verb, a, a, you know, besets the women. I don't think being a father is as much as a career effect on their art career as it is for a woman. Um, well, that's interesting that you say that. In the book, a lot of people are parents. And so uh, in the book, you will see uh, – that, but most of the women talk about it and not the men, and that's very exactly. interesting. Uh, but I will say that there are artists out there who are uh, fathers who are artists, like Joshua Levine in Los Angeles. I just saw him last week. He stays home with the child while Rachel, his wife, uh, brings in the money, and so the majority of the money has a full-time job. So that kind of interchangeability with roles and careers, I think that that's just, part of uh, society right now. Um, but I do agree. I think it can be hard for a woman, um, and I think that uh, especially a woman who's an artist. But Danielle Tegeter, who uh, is an amazing artist, she did it too, and she's married to an artist, and uh, so did Jean Shin, and there are many artists out there or women who are doing it. I think that stereotype is 
going away, thank God. I mean, if you're an artist and you have children, you're looked down upon. I think that that's over. And, and it's also over that if you teach, too, you can be an artist educator as a part of your practice and make a living. Let's open this up for questions. If you guys have questions to share and and or comments and or something from the book, um, raise your hand. That's interesting. So, um, you see the mom parenting thing as a kind of societal pressure or prejudice. I see it mostly as the mom is more involved in the child's upbringing and has time constraints. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not a parent, so I, I and I chose that. Um, but uh, and I have a lot of reverence and admiration for that. But you know, Michelle's husband Brad is an artist, and he's a right. great father. And I think that he also contributes just as much or in a different way than Michelle. But they do it together. So I don't know. I, I can't answer to that. And you're a parent, and you could probably talk about it better than me. And so, some of the other um, people that are here can talk about. It. I have great reverence. I, I, Oprah. Oprah has said that's the hardest job in the world. I totally agree with her. Um, so I I think that uh, it's something I I admire. I I didn't have children. Just maybe it's maybe it's hopefully it's not TMI, but because my parents didn't pay for my education, I left school with one hundred fifteen thousand dollars in debt. I paid that off through a lot of creative financing and my work um, over the years, which made, I got I paid it all off by 2001, but the the thing is I didn't want any of my children to ever go through that, and I knew that I was not going to be able to pay for their education, and that was a very, very important thing in my life, and that was a big sticking point for me, but also I just am not that kind of nurturer, although I do teach children, and I love them, and I love glowtown.org, which is a big workshop I do all over the country, so I mean, hopefully I contribute in different ways, but I can never contribute like a parent does in a great way. We do what we can. Um, Valerie, go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, um, you know, all the all these different, you know, possibilities for um, pathways. Um, anyway, I, I went to art school in Boston, and then I went to graduate school in, in San Diego. And I actually um, graduated in 1979. And at that time, it was kind of like, unless you went to New York, um, without the internet, you know, one was very isolated. And so my other, it was like, I could move to LA or New York. Um, but my, you know, my, kind of my not being uh, part of a community, really, um, eventually I, you know, joined some, like, you know, kind of feminist women artists groups, but um, I was so fed up with the art world and my lack of, you know, possibilities to, to teach or to work or, now I'm a central law school, but instead I got married and I raised a family. So um, my, um, my husband, who was not an artist um, and for a while was supportive, um, finally decided he said to me, you're never going to make any money if you are, and he turned his back, and then he divorced me. But Ah, oh, terrible. Yeah. But, but the good thing is that, that um, you know, he offered me half his salary as a, you know, spousal support because I had stayed home with the children. And, you know, children had, you know, there were, there were health issues and, and uh, you know, problems and that really required this energy and time and focus. So I had a studio in the garage, but, but you know, my, I, I really couldn't be the full-time artist and professional that, you know, that I wanted to be. But now I am, like, I, I just, um, I, I, I moved close to L.A. I did a one-year artist in residence program. At UC Irvine, I was able to produce a new body of work, and now, yeah. So now, um, with the advent, you're really having the internet and having, um, you know, being able to make a website, being able to connect and link, 
And um, one of the things that I'm finding really helpful, I'm reading a book, Making Ideas Happen. Scott Belsky, Belsky uh, he has a, um, you know, MBA from Harvard, and he's worked with, you know, cultural groups. And um, and so he has kind of a, like, three points that, that I think have been really helpful and, and really connect with what you're talking about. And the first is um, the ability to organize your project. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's that. And then second is um, uh, creating community. Yes, absolutely. And that's what you've been talking about and how how you build your community, how you create, you know, the community that you want to speak to, want to interact with, and um, how big that can be, I think, is a really exciting, you know, the realm of possibility to really discuss. And then the last thing is 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 your your own leadership capacity. Yes. And, and I think this is a incredible, you know, way to really consider making ideas happen because that is the balance. And then, you know, I think there's also this, and I I I've always had the, uh, this dichotomy and this issue between a kind of a um, you know. Cultural producer, um, you know, uh, underlying philosophy of meaning and art, and you know how, like Rauschenberg said, art can change the world. Okay, how do we do that? But also the issue of like, but also art as an object and things that are beautiful, and you know how that's considered in the world, and how we, you know, I think these are really big issues that that artists are grappling with and trying to figure out. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I'm thrilled that you're rebounding your life and doing what you're doing now. And I'm thrilled that you, you're you engaged in what you're doing now. That's wonderful. I'm just sad that you had to endure that comment from your ex-husband. Um, I think that Although I'm saddened by that, I'm not surprised by that, by what I've been hearing on the book tour. And um, people equate money with success, and there is such a thing as creative capital. And when you have a lot of creative capital that is not equated to money, you are looked upon as being wealthier than one who has just a lot of money in the bank. So, um, no, I think that that was very short-sighted of him, and I'm hoping that you take that uh, drive that you have and run it into the ground and show him, here's my Sicilian coming out, show him that I have a richer life than you would ever think that I would ever have because of that, uh, that comment. I mean, that's just, that I've seen over and over again on the book tour, and we talk about what is success today because that's what's come out of the book. And actually, this book was peer-reviewed, and one of the things the peer reviewer said was it examines the identity of what a contemporary artist is today. And uh, we take all forms, but the fact that you're doing this for yourself and contributing to the world as you are now, I mean, I applaud you. I think that's great. I just say keep going. This is your time. And one of, one of my themes that is really echoing and is um, learning again to transform walls into doors. Well, I think learning to transform what into what? You were muffled there. Learning to transform walls into doors. Walls into doors, absolutely. You know what's so great about being an artist is we can do anything we want because we have our ideas. If you, those ideas that have been within you have never died. It's just a matter of when you decide to bring them forward what, at whatever time is going to be good for you. So that's what you're doing now, and you create your open doors. Uh, artists can do that. I was just had a big conversation with this artist who's perceived to be very sort of well-known. She has a gallery in New York, and but she can't. She could not make a connection as to how to make – she's not feeling good about her career. And how can she make a creative life 
even though that per perceptually she has this idea that she's doing really, really well um, to the outside world, but she's incredibly unhappy. And then I took her through the steps as to how I think she could get out there in the world. She's in her 60s, and she's going to do it. Great. Good luck. <laughs> cool. Um, Monica, Monica, how are you doing? You have some new knees recently. Monica, how are you? Hey, was my day. I just got back from the hospital after Good. four days, and I have two new knees, and it's it's challenging still. Wow! Congratulations, <laughs> that's amazing. Yes, yeah. I, it's it's well, this is one of these transformative things that I have been needing to do, take the step to become, you know, to heighten my creative life. So you look Sharon, relieved. I, Go ahead. I look relieved. I am relieved. I am. It was a huge weight, and I am relieved. So I, you know, I'm just. You know, I'm still like just hoping it goes well. We're still working on it, so it will. You, it's not a matter of hope; it's a matter of confidence. <laughs> but Sharon, I don't know if you re wait. Can I ahead, ask Sharon. a question? Did you get both knees replaced? I did both the bilateral double knee. Wow, you got to talk to Joanne Matera. Do you know her? Joanne, I'll write it down. It sounds really familiar. Joanne's an yeah. artist who about a half an hour from you. M A T E R A. She works at Encosta. Joanne, you know, I'm so, I, I think you know her. It sounds so familiar. Sure, I don't know if you, re you remember. Go ahead. Yeah, Joanne I'm Matera. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if you're on Facebook, Facebook and send her a message and just tell her I sent you and ask her. She just had her knee surgery done last month. So you guys yeah. are three peas in a pod. You can help each other. That is wonderful. I love because you know it's really hard, but people don't quite know how horrific it is <laughs> until Sorry, if they haven't done I can't, it. Yeah. Can't believe you're laughing. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just so relieved that there is a horizon of without pain that I know is coming. So, you know, I'm I'm just glad that I was brave enough to do it. That's great. Yes. Are you frozen, Sharon? I don't know if you remember me. I'm a friend of Sharon Butler's, and I was at your talk at UConn. I think at UConn. You looked very familiar. I, I yeah, I mean, I'm a, do you teach? Do you teach there? Right, I'm one of the two sculpture professors with Ray. That's right. I remember you. Right, and you came through the pit and saw. You know, we were setting up some ceramics. I think when you came through. That's right. I can't believe it. Nice to see you again. Yeah, it goes around and around, and I still haven't had the knees to walk over and see the piece, but I'm going to, and I probably am going to miss your convocation talk. You're not convocation, I graduation talk. I cannot talk. believe it. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for having me at UConn. If everybody, oh, if people don't know what we're talking about, um, I'm so grateful. Monica and her colleagues and the students invite, right, invited me to be the uh, commencement speaker for the School of Fine Arts at UConn. So I'm, I'm working on that speech right now. Well, if I can get in a wheelchair and get there, I'm going to be there. But Oh, my God, but I, that's crazy. <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. When's the talk? Well, it's it'll the, be the right the beginning of May. It's like three weeks from now. May, 10th at, May 10th at 5 o'clock, I think, or yeah, something. Yeah, that's right, May 10th. You will not need a wheelchair. Really? Really? I don't think so. Oh. You should talk All to right. Joanne. I don't think you will. She's, she's right. walking around and doing her thing. So, um, well, I, but that, I do have a qu uh, question. Okay. In addition to all that, so thank you for the support. I, I have had so much from everybody, and it's just been really great. I'm sure it's been part of the healing. So, um, but I, I did want to ask. So, when 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 you did the CAA panel. Was the CAA panel about this topic, about, you know, sustaining the creative life? Or was it sort of a completely different topic and they were interested maybe in a book about your work, but then you proposed this other thing? Yeah, no. They, uh, the panel was how to make a living with or without a dealer. And over oh, okay. 400 people were there. And it was widely uh, accepted uh, and not accepted, received. Um, and uh, in one way, that's really good. In another way, it sucks, because why were those people there? That's the, the question I have for everybody. <laughs> so, right. uh, so, but uh, no, they came up to me after that and said, uh, would you want to write a book? And uh, it wasn't about my work, but they, I mean, it could have been. 
but they're an academic publisher, and they it's Intellect Books with the University of Chicago Press. So a small publisher and big distributor, and they both work together like, and, and I've just learned in publishing, that's what happens. They both entities work together. And so it's, it's um, uh, they approached me and I said, listen, they wanted me to write a book. And I just said, I'm not interested in giving any advice. That's not who I am. So I just said, I would love to contribute, uh, you know, something else that is more, um, just more to my interest and then brings artists together and has 40 voices. And, and I will tell you about the book. We get 8% profit. We have no advance. 8% profit. And that 8% is divided amongst all of my contributors and myself. So 44 people slice the pie up. And even if we sold 15,000 books, we would get $300 a piece. So it's not about money at all. We have sold about 5,000 books and, and 1,000 e-books. Hold on, Monica. I muted you because there was some back. Okay, go ahead. Monica, did you to, go ahead if you to, want to say more, Monica. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say I was at CAA this uh, February, you know, kind of hobbling around, but I did manage to get to a couple of the panels that were, again, about this pa topic, and they were packed. You know, the art and family one, which I think, is that the one you introduced? And Sharon was supposed to be there, but she got sick, Sharon Butler. Right. Uh, I mean, there are, you know, that, that, I, that, I mean, that's, that it's still an amazing yeah. topic. Yeah, I mean, that program, that artist-based program at CAA is about artist empowerment and, uh, and uh, you know, a connection between academia and the, and the public and the art world because it's a conference within a conference. So, great. yeah, it's, it was great. I'm glad you attended. They're all free and open to the public. Well, the other question is, you know, I would love to get – it's the one time that I felt a real interest in getting involved in CAA because I have always – felt that CAA, you know, I got more involved in Mid-America CAA because it, it was more about the artists and less sort of yeah. about the art historians. And not that I don't, I mean, I love art history too. That's my, my undergrad is art history. So, but, you know, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, and I'm hoping, you know, part of my renewal here is to get more involved in CAA and in the artist space because it just seems really a valuable addition to that, uh, you know, to the program. It's great. They have a call for nominations every year. I'm now off the committee and because I did my time and yeah. I was a chair chair for a few years. But they have a uh, a nomination uh, process in which in which you can just apply and you're able to get. Um, uh, I mean, depending on the makeup of the committee, and yeah. they approve people or they don't approve. But yeah. I think you would be great on that committee, and it's great. It's fun. It's a lot of work, but it's yeah. wonderful. It's a great opportunity. Yeah, it sounds great. All right, thank I you very you much. I hope you feel better. You I will. I am out to Joanne. She will help you out enormously. You I guys will do are that. in the same boat right now. I'll look her up. She's a painter? No, she does in caustic. She's a, uh, uh, I, I would say she does a lot of drawings and paintings uh, with yeah. caustic. Great. Thank we've, you. Also, we've done a webinar with Joanne a couple of years ago. I mean, you could find that, too, if you wanted to. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank that's you. great. All right. Nice to see you again. I hope I see you again soon. Yeah, I do, too. I'll try to make it to, to commencement. Okay, I'd love to see you walking there. Thank you, Monica. Bob, go ahead. Take care. Hi, um, Bob. Hi, hi Sharon. Thank you. And I, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, I, I think it's Thank a great you. format. Thank would you. Would you say, I, I, since I haven't read it, would you say that someone who is a full-time artist and who's not getting to do other other things that that kind of weave in and create this this uh, this fabric of of a life, and are, would you think a full-time artist is potentially at a disadvantage of not having these other influences, or or is it sort of like trying to, I don't know, what would we talk I about? Think I well, it's very interesting. That's a great question. I think that um, I, I had asked Jonathan Neal, who's the head of Sotheby's Institute in Los Angeles. We had lunch. Like, I just saw him last week. But we had lunch last summer, and the, I had asked him a question. I said, 
What do you think is the key to an artist's success right now? Uh, what, what do you think is one of the factors for an artist to be successful? And he said traction. So what is that? And it makes sense because when you're – the rest of the world is living in this – and the art world is living in this sort of reality-based um, uh, moment where if somebody's right in front of you, you'll pay attention to them. Even – like if I scroll in my Gmail, the people who bother me, quote, bother me the most, not bother me, but ask me questions. People who bother me, I delete them after I tell them not to bother me. But the people who are – are checking in on me or talking, I'm going to get to them right away, people who are create a deadline. And so uh, I, I think that some kind of measure of traction for you as an artist is going to create success in whatever way that that means for you. So if you're an artist who's just painting in your studio every day, that can create traction if you get yourself out there because the gallery is only going to be, you know, showing you every so often. They're not going to be showing you, like, every day, right, or probably not as often as you want them to. So you, you probably are going to have to make some inroads. Today is a different day than it was 20 years ago or 25 years ago when I got out of college, 23. And I feel like uh, artists have to adapt to certain uh, ways in which they are working now. That's if you want that. If I have a friend of mine, James, James Lecce, he shows at Mackenzie Fine Art. His expenses are so low. He, all he does is paint, and he sells work, and he lives a very quiet life. He's very private. He's very, he's very, very um, uh, tin self, and he lives his life, and that's great, and that's wonderful, but he also complains sometimes to me, which I'm saying publicly because I'll tell him that when I see him next too, that he, he, like every other artist, is disgruntled and not getting enough. But you know, I tell him, you've got to do X, Y, and Z, and he doesn't want to do it. And I think that you have to live with what is good for you in your life. And if it's uncomfortable for you to go out into the world in different ways, so be it, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I think the artist who... You want something else beyond just staying at home or painting by an easel or whatever it is, they're going to have to do something themselves to make that happen. I do think that the artists, I think that the artists who are doing more outside of their, just their initial practice are the ones who are getting traction, who are making more inroads. Thank you. I'm thinking about that, and I'm wondering to what extent I agree. I don't well, know. Show me an example of somebody who isn't. Jason Middlebrook comes to mind for me first. I mean, as someone who is not pursuing diversified careers, but is solely, you know, focusing on making his art. No, but he's all over social media. He's on Instagram. He's on Twitter. He's on Facebook. Of course he is. He's yes, those. but he's not, he's not teaching. He doesn't have an administrative oh, position. Yes, of course. Of course, but I don't either. You know, I, I teach part-time, but he's out there. He's not just closing the doors. He is, he, I just heard that. I just read that from Bob as speaking like the extreme of like that tra traditional artist who's just making their work. But Jason Milbrook is making opportunities for himself. He always has. And he's always got his I, I, read, I heard Bob's question to be about having multiple careers simultaneously. Oh, no. I don't think you need to do that necessarily, but I do think – I don't think you need to have multiple careers. First of all, I don't see it as a division of a career either. I mean, just because I'm doing all these different things, I'm curating, I'm doing a book, I, I teach, it doesn't mean I, only, I have all these careers. I have one career. So I don't see it as any different. I guess I was thinking multiple ways in which they're out in the world. Well, I, don't the person, I, don't, I don't want to name the name. See if you can figure out who I'm talking about. Who works for creative capital, makes his own artwork, has his own gallery, and does one more thing. You know who Matthew I'm talking about. Matthew Gallagher. He's in the Whitney. So he's Follow amazing. Follow him Matthew's name. Okay, fine. Is, is that a good role model? Absolutely. Or no question about it. For me, totally. But then James, who's the traditional artist, if you will, 
is also a great mo- 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 uh, role model. Can't talk to him. I'm so excited. Because he is sustaining his creative life as he wants it to be. Look, I think to be an artist is such an amazing gift. We're not up at 5 o'clock in the morning mining coal. We're not at McDonald's, where most of us aren't flipping hamburgers. We're not uh, doing things that we don't want to do. And so, for the most part. And I think that uh, a lot of artists forget that. And so, any artist who's been able to sustain their creative practice over time is a role model. That might be a good place to wrap this up. Really? Any other questions? <laughs> Sharon wants to keep going. I don't see any more questions. I'll take another if we got another one. Anybody want to ask a question? I think we came to a logical conclude, conclusion place. Monica, your hand is still up, but I'm assuming your feet aren't. Or oh, maybe they are. Monica, did you want to ask something else? I do want to ask. I'm I'm very curious about whether you feel that the formalist and abstract aspect, you know, your vision being formalist and abstract, that kind of capacity to produce that vision is, is what am I trying to say? Is it more, uh, does, does it perforce get, or does it just, if so facto, get more traction in the world, do you think, than more narrative, uh, not necessarily figurative, but, you know, content-driven work? Well, my work doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I have, I, I, I have, it's so amazing how people perceive my life. Some people think that I'm doing, like, so well. I don't know, even know what that means. But um, uh, I, uh, I, I constantly apologize to my dealers because I feel like my dealers are, are uh, they're not they're not able to sell a lot of my work it's not it's not it's not selling like hotcakes right now but it's it's getting a different view like through museums so um so i i don't know i i I think i can't gauge the art world right now because it's so vast and uh wide wide ranging i mean i I haven't seen the whitney biennial because i haven't been there yet but i even like that that breadth of like what Michelle curated part of it and the uh, mm-hmm. of the biennial. I just don't think abstraction necessarily is you can pigeonhole it right now. I, I think you yeah. can pigeonhole anything right now, to be honest. I think there are yeah. many artists doing different things, and for one reason or another, they come forward or not. I think a, a lot of it might have to do with, too, just uh, people, the people who are behind it. Like it takes a village, too, like the collectors or curators, who really are behind these these artists that can uh, sustain uh, their living um, in the way that meaning they're propping them up uh, for artificial mm-hmm. or for valid reasons. But mm-hmm. I think all that stuff is really random and unpredictable. Yeah. So do do museum venues not uh, impress your dealers, your galleries? Your gallery? Oh, totally. I mean, I mostly show museums, which I love, 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 and that's the context yeah. for my work. But um, but uh, that's the absolute context for my work. But um, no, I just feel bad because some years are not so great financially, you know, and I mm-hmm. think a dealer wants to sell work. They are a vendor. So, yeah, you know, that's yeah. what they're no they're we have, I have a great relationship with all my dealers right now, really good mm-hmm. with all four of them. I have a great relationship mm-hmm. with them. Thank you for asking thanks. I love that mm-hmm. question while you're in bed with your knees. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I'm curious. <laughs> I love that you are a working artist um, Thank you. Right. Does anybody Thank you both. anybody have any other questions? Looks to me like we are good. Sharon, this has been grand. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Let me unmute everybody. Everybody is unmuted. Sharon, I love you. I appreciate it. Enjoy the sunshine in the Bay Area, and I'll see you somewhere soon. Thank you, everybody.